Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name's Tim. I'm an alcoholic. Thank you to the many people who've made such sterling efforts to put this wonderful event on and the people that have looked after me uh, and my other half so well this week. Um, I was a little disconcerted listening to Paul because I thought, I- I'm English, uh, uh, we don't have a blessing to give you. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what I'm going to do at the end. I... I could sing all things bright and beautiful. (laughs) But I don't think that would hit quite the right notes, so... I'm I'm going to get a few facts out of the way to stop people doing mathematics on a Friday evening. Um, I got sober when I was 21. I'm 52 now. Um, My home group is the Brick Lane Big Book Study in London. I do a bunch of other groups as well. Uh, if any Al-Anon principles leak into my talk this evening, I'm not sorry. <laughs> if it wasn't for Al-Anon, I don't think I could have stayed in AA. That's for me. Um, and I do a lot of Al-Anon still, and it saved my bacon. Uh, but I'm chiefly an alcoholic. And I'm going to get straight into step two. There's a little bit of a bait and switch here because it gets to step two and it talks about a restoration to sanity. And I'm like, wait, wait a moment. We haven't established that I'm insane first. (laughs) It... You've presupposed that we've agreed that. (laughs) And I've always loved AA. You can tell I love it because I complain about it constantly. (laughs) And meetings in my early days infuriated me because... I couldn't work out what alcoholism was from listening to people's stories because everyone's story was different. And um, I've heard it, I I hear it almost every week, someone getting drunk and getting on a plane in blackout and waking up on the other side of the planet. One, One hears this story on a regular, and all sorts of other things, dancing on tables and, and kissing the boss and so on. <laughs> and it is true that these, these you know, demonstrate great folly, but that, that they're, not, <laughs> they're not necessarily the insanity of alcoholism, which I think is far more chilling. Before I get to the insanity, I've got to explain one thing. Um, and it's the so-called physical craving. And that's a very difficult thing. We've, it's already been talked about, but I need to put it in my words too. I'm going to tread all over the other steps because step two, the picture of step two is enclosed in the frame of the other 11 steps. And we need the frame before we can look at the picture. And the physical craving, uh, the trouble is the word craving in the language generally means something quite different. It means you really, really, really want something, and once you get it, you're good. Whereas the physical craving with alcohol is you can be just minding your own business, and someone gives you a little chocolate, and you bite it, and it's got a liqueur in it, and you're like, now we're off. It starts with the ingestion of the substance. The ingestion of the substance doesn't squish it, it amplifies it, it sets it off. So it's it's almost the opposite of what is talked about out there. 
And my question to myself, I needed to diagnose myself as an alcoholic. The stories inspired me and told me in a general way I was in the right place. I needed to diagnose myself as an alcoholic. Point number one, what happens when I drink? And my 18th birthday is almost the only illustration I need. Of course I aimed to get drunk. It was my 18th birthday, for heaven's sake. But I started drinking at 7 p.m., and by 7.45, I was throwing up in a bush. Not the bush. That means something different here. A a bush. Just one. Um, I was so ill within 45 minutes. The, The evening was basically over. When I drink, I massively overshoot. I also, when I start drinking after a period of sobriety, I go into a sort of trance where I forgot all, I forget all the reasons why I might have stopped drinking. And so I stopped drinking for three months when I was 18, and my life got measurably better. In all sorts of ways, I started again. It was a year and a half before I even considered stopping again. So I can never, ever have a safe drink. Good, we've now concluded that. Um, We're left with what? What is the insanity? It's not the things I do when I'm drunk. It's the fact that, I'll give you um, one example. There are many. One example. I was in AA. It was... April, May 1993, I traveled across Russia. I was living in Russia. I traveled across Russia to find uh, some uh, English-speaking meetings. I was going to the Russian-speaking meetings in St. Petersburg, which were, which were not great. Uh, they're, they're a lot better now. But there, were, there was one group, now there are 120 in St. Petersburg. I traveled to Moscow to find an English-speaking group. And I was with some friends, and we found the building, we found the room, and there was no one there. And I asked an old woman who was sweeping in front of the building where the Americans were. She said, oh, they haven't been here for months. The next thing I did was the insanity of alcoholism. I had a beer to reward me for the effort that I had made. (laughs) And I went into blackout and got very badly lost in an unfamiliar city. And I don't know how I found my way home. I I might, in other circumstances, have said, God looks after drunks, and I got back to the place that I was staying. But God doesn't seem to look after everyone. So was God looking after me, or was it just luck? The insanity is the insanity of quietly taking a gun out of my pocket, just as I'm chatting to people, lifting it to my temple, I'm still chatting, and pulling the trigger. The trigger being having the first drink. A friend of mine drank again in 1995, and he's still drinking 28 years later. Another friend drank in 1993. He didn't turn up at the Friday meeting. We went to the halls of residence he was living in the next morning, and they told us he died of an overdose the night before. And there are all sorts of things in between. So the sanity I'm restored to, as is promised by step two, The sanity is a very specific sanity. Um, I would hear people say when I was new in AA that uh, they weren't very well wrapped before they ever drank and while they were drinking. And and people say, there was no sanity for me to be restored to. You know, sanity was an entirely new concept. 
But the insanity they're talking about in the steps, I, I don't think has got anything to do with other... I, I was very ill when I got to AA, as well as my alcoholism. It's not talking about that. The restoration is the restoration to the state I was in before I ever drank in relation to alcohol. And I'll tell you what that was for me. My brother was an alcoholic who committed suicide. And when I saw him drinking, when I was 11, I thought, I'm not going to do what he's doing. It's idiotic. He's killing himself. And at 11, I, w I, wouldn't have I wouldn't have touched it. There was a sanity I was being restored to, which is the sanity of self-preservation. And what that sanity looks like today, um, when I was around 10 years sober, I, I hadn't been to many meetings for a couple of years, and I hadn't drunk, but I'd become, shall we say, a little eccentric. <laughs> and I found myself in a, I'm not going to, to be too lurid, but in a, situa in a situation with a person. And they offered me some drugs. And sanity, even though I wanted to take them, a little voice in my head said, Go home and go home now. And I did. I remember when I was a year and a half sober, I was walking home and the thought fluttered across my mind as I passed a pub where the door opened and a warm, beery, smoky fug billowed out. And the thought crossed my mind. I'm really tense. And if I have a drink, I won't be. And another thought came into my mind. Get your little legs moving along the street, left, right, left, right, left. And I got home. Sanity, to me, is doing the right thing in admittedly those rare moments when the thought of a drink occurs to me. But it is doing the right thing regardless of what I feel and what I think because I've been trained. Uh, at a very good group in Plymouth, in England, they say it's a little bit like military training. The reason we're drilled is so that under enemy fire, there is a chance that the training will just automatically kick in. And I found that happen again and again and again. When it says in step two, so we've got the sanity down, we've got the restoration, could restore us to sanity. That used to worry me because I was a slipper for a number of years. And I'm not worried about it anymore because what I understand is this, it's what Paul was saying. Uh, there isn't a cosmic lottery, I don't think, deciding who's going to get sober. And who's not? Um, there are difficult cases on the margins. I'll concede that. I, and I've known some difficult cases on the margins. But by and large, as soon as I started taking all the actions that were indicated, I stopped relapsing. And I've sponsored hundreds of people, and it's been the same every single time. God could, not if he feels like it, or if, if the higher power feels like it. Uh, he, he can and will if I do my part. So it's not a case of a magic wand being waved. And in a sense, it feels miraculous. That 180 degree turn that Paul was talking about, that you're going in one direction, and suddenly you're going in entirely the opposite direction. If you're watching a billiard table and a ball which is uh, careening towards one of the pockets suddenly stops and shoots back in the other direction, you'd say, well, that's against the laws of physics. That's a miracle. A miracle is an intervention 
in the natural order of things. But what if you learned that uh, there was an invisible billiards player? It would suddenly start to explain all the erratic movements of the, the balls on the billiard table. And then you learn that the billiard ball can talk to the person that's holding the billiard cue. This changes the game entirely. So God can and will. That's a promise. And there's a, I'm not a Christian, uh, but there is a, a Christian idea of God is not mocked. So that promise that comes through, God, and, God could and would if he were sought, the fulfillment of that condition lies with me, not with anyone else. I can get well regardless of anything with alcohol and with everything else, but alcohol is the cast iron guarantee. Other things have been a work in progress for a very long time. There's a meeting. I shouldn't say this if this is recorded, but I'm going to. <laughs> you said you weren't going to say it. I know, but I'm going to say um, It's a very nice meeting. Lovely people. They say, but what they say is, we came for the drinking, but we stayed for the thinking. I'm staying for the not drinking bit of AA. I really am. I mean, I love you all, but everything else is gravy on top. If all that I... I stopped relapsing when I said in my mind to AA, I don't care if any of your rotten promises ever come true as long as I never again have the indignity of being arrested at 12 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon, watching everyone come out of my AA meeting I've just left to get drunk. If I can have the dignity of not drinking, I'm good, fine. So the only requirement for membership of AA is a desire to stop drinking, and the only requirement I had of AA was that it keep me sober. And I realized why I'd been relapsing before. I will stay sober as long as I'm reasonably comfortable. I'll stay sober as long as things are going my way. I'll stay sober as long as I'm not required to believe anything incredible or do anything disagreeable. I experienced an unconditional surrender, uh, which is not a joyous moment. <laughs> it was a moment of glum, gloomy resignation. <laughs> the fight had gone out of me. That's when the turning point happened. This power greater than ourselves, again, I'm going to build on what Paul said, that you can't read the label from inside the jar, and certainly not from inside the bottle. Um, I'm going to give an example from another area than alcohol. A few years ago, I found myself impossibly upset by many things going on in the world, uh, particularly environmental things. And what I've learned to do in step 12 is to practice these principles in all my affairs. So what I've learned to do is to look at step one, how does this apply in this situation? Look at step two, how does this apply in this situation? Step one was, I'm very unhappy. I was very tense every time something about the climate or related topics came on the news. I had to quarantine these uh, these affairs. I, I couldn't have the radio on. I couldn't have the television on. And, and news and information would leak or seep into my life. And I felt I had to have boundaries everywhere to stop the information coming in because I would hear something that would set me going off mentally for a day or so till I battened it down again. And it wasn't simply at the level of 
you know, what's going to happen to me in the future. It was totally tied up with the idea of a higher power. So um, what would happen if humanity ceases to exist? What, what is God left on his own then? What happens to us? My notion of a higher power is very much tied to the material realm and our relationship with God in the material realm. If God, you know, the pantheistic idea that God is in nature, what happens if nature is destroyed? Where is God then? Um, very, very difficult conundrum I found myself in. A power greater than ourselves. What I needed to do was to recognize in step one, that I could not solve this problem myself, particularly by thinking about it, particularly by reason, particularly by reading philosophy, trying to apply philosophy or ideas or bumper stickers. This was not going to go away with a bumper sticker. It required something from outside the system. My experience is that God's voice is very, very quiet. And when my own voice is very, very loud, I can't hear a power greater than myself. And there's a little sequence I was taught, which I think fits with step two. Um, and it goes like this. First of all, I don't like how I feel. You can't convince me of anything at this point, but I can admit one thing. I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I'm touchy. My friends literally have lists of things they can't mention because I'll be triggered. <laughs> the most I could say initially was... I don't like how I feel. And so, I hope I'm wrong. Now, that doesn't mean to say that certain facts in the material world are not facts. This isn't a recipe for mindless Pollyannaism, to say that things are really splendid and wonderful that are not splendid and wonderful. When people are suffering, they're suffering. You, you can't sugarcoat that. You'll pretend it's not there. But my relationship to those facts, that is what matters. And in that regard, I must be wrong. If I'm not wrong, Chuck Chamberlain in A New Pair of Glasses says something to the effect of this. If there is a problem in my life that God cannot solve, I might as well jump off a bridge now. So I better hope that I'm wrong. There's a coffee machine principle. I don't know if any of you have got a fancy coffee machine at home. It's Sydney, so you probably do, especially, <laughs> especially if you're from the northern suburbs. <laughs> Thank you for traveling such a long way to come and see us down here. Um, I can only say that because most of my friends in Sydney are in the northern suburbs, and I warned them I, would be, I might be saying something about that. My coffee machine at home, uh, when it makes a delightful purring sound, we know it's okay. It's a happy little coffee machine making its happy little cups of coffee for me. When it makes a, a, a sort of growling, cranking industrial sound, something horrible has happened to it. And it is not being operated in accordance with manufacturer's instructions. <laughs> when I'm not being operated in accordance with the manufacturer's <laughs> instructions, <laughs> my head makes a horrible noise. If I'm unhappy, no, wrong word, if I'm disturbed, I'm wrong. 
sometimes unhappiness is simply the price of something that has been lost, which was of value. My best friend of decades died of alcoholism three months ago. And I've been very unhappy. But I've been seldom disturbed. There's a difference. There was some preparation. And I've got a higher power. There are other things I'll come to about that, maybe. So, if I'm disturbed, this is straight from the 12. I'm not making this up. This is straight from the 12 and 12 as well. If I'm disturbed about anything, there is something wrong in my thinking. So, let's recap. Um, I don't like how I feel. Therefore, I must be assessing this situation wrongly. I must have made a wrong decision in some way. And then to say, it would really benefit me if there were a different way to look at this. And I really hope there is a different way to look at this. What could I lose by asking? And it's, I didn't make that sequence up. It was given to me by uh, a member in AA who got it from somewhere. But it's immensely effective at ungluing me from my preconceptions about how the world operates. And when I was very new in AA, I could be proved wrong very quickly by people who weren't even very skilled because I was so delusional. Uh, being sober longer, it got harder, actually, as I thought, well, I know things now. I'm not technically wrong. <laughs> what I've learned to do, having detached myself from the whole of what I think about everything. You see, this is the problem. I had a friend who was in relapse a, a, a long time ago. And talking to him was like, it was like talking to, you know, they make those balls of rubber bands where it's just rubber bands on rubber bands on rubber bands. It's just made of rubber bands. And you pull one of the rubber bands and it's attached to some other rubber bands. And you can't pull any of the rubber bands off because they go all the way through. And whatever you said, there was a counter argument from somewhere else in the system. And so it was impossible to get this poor chap to move on any individual point because the whole system was broken. Which is why when I'm screwed on a single issue, I have to set aside everything that I believe about everything, which is terrifying. Because how do you get through the day? And this is where the AA program comes in. On awakening, we ask God to direct our thinking. Uh, not grand thoughts about politics or economics or philosophy, but our thinking about the 24 hours ahead and what is to go on my to-do list. That's literally all I need to concern myself with. And... The remarkable thing is that this works immensely well at the most intractable mental, psychological, emotional problems, but doesn't work straight away. My experience with the transformations that have happened over the last 30 years is there is a period of desert when I finally let go and I'm reduced to simply putting one foot in front of another. I've already got the belief that God in principle ought to be able to do anything. It's another line from the book. He ought to be able to do anything. Faith is when I convert that theoretical belief into action, which is putting one foot in front of another, even though I cannot see anything that's in front of me. I'm still miserable. 
I don't suddenly become cheerful at this point. Almost literally everyone in my family uh, has been institutionalized for depression and anxiety or worse. So the, the hand of cards I was dealt, the odds were against me. So I don't become instantly cheerful. But what I've learned to do is to walk through those periods and then one by one, elements of a new way of looking at things start to reveal themselves. And gradually, jigsaw puzzle pieces get placed inside the jigsaw. And then I turn around a few years later and I think, I'm okay now. And I couldn't have got there by reading books or thinking about things. I had to switch off the thinking faculty. Now, this isn't a recipe for becoming uh, an idiot in the world. So I still have to do technical thinking. My job involves thinking. Um, my uh, other half used to refer to my job as, as alchemy because I sit at a computer and type and then money comes in. And, and, um, uh, and then he changed his characterization of it. He started to call it typing. He said, have you done good typing today? <laughs> And it's got even worse now. He refers to my job as spelling. <laughs> I just have to spell words. But I used to be so tied up in the idea of my identity in a career that it was a stroke of genius that he started to reclassify what I did. And now, I, when I go into the office, I literally think all I have to do is type. There is a limited number of letters. There is a limited number of other characters on the keyboard. I just have to put them in the right order and go home. I don't need to get involved in anything else that is going on. I just need to put the right letters in the right order. And this is what I'm talking about. Turning off the opinion-making monster. putting it in its little cage, putting it in the neck, giving it something to chew on. <laughs> Get it to learn how to do Japanese kanji, something which takes... <laughs> Seriously, if you have to use your mind for something, at least find something useful to do with it. Le I mean, learn a skill, for heaven's sake. But thinking about yourself. Step two for me is about dethroning myself as the highest wise authority in the land and asking instead to be shown. And on the two topics of the environmental stuff, and a lot of people are troubled by other things in the world. I saw some people outside this center today who seem troubled by some things going on locally, uh, one way or another. What I've learnt, if, if what I've learnt in AA means anything, it means this. And it's I'm going to read a, read from the book. I wasn't meaning to, but it's here. So, since the good good Lord put it here, I might as well read from it. Um, <laughs> My mother's French, and when I was growing up, if you, if you were milling around, she would say, puisque le bon Dieu t'a mis là, she'd say, since the good Lord put you there, you might as well make yourself useful. And she'd, she'd give you, so you'd learn not to mill around, because <laughs> you'd be given up the, the very time-consuming chore. Um, if what we have learned and felt and seen means anything at all, it means that all of us, whatever our race, creed, or color, are the children of a living creator with whom we may form a relationship upon simple and understandable terms as soon as we are willing and honest enough to try. And uh, the answer to everything, I think, is in there. Children of a living creator. If you have a cat, 
and it has kittens. The kittens will be very small cats. They won't be another species. <laughs> they, they won't be rutabagas. They won't be <laughs> possums. They'll be cats. If I'm the child of a living creator, I'm made of the same stuff. So, uh, and what is God? God is spirit. God is consciousness. Most of the religions agree on that. Sometimes, I'm going to be controversial, um, <laughs> sometimes people think back to their Catholic upbringing and say, you know, I was taught that God is a, you know, an old man with a beard that sits on a cloud in the sky. I don't know any Catholics that teach that. Maybe there might have been a rogue nun or two. Who knows what was going on there? <laughs> but you go to the Vatican website, and uh, what, uh, it's got a and a More than the Church of England does. But anyway, um, <laughs> they're trying to please everyone. Oh, I should... I, I should is this being... T this shouldn't be... T we just, you can bleep that stuff out. Anyway, what's the point? The point is this. On the Q&A, it says, what is God? God is spirit. God is not material. God is not male or female. God doesn't have a body. If I'm a child of God, I'm not material. I'm not male or female. I'm not... Those labels, I get to check boxes at the sexually transmitted diseases clinic... <laughs> There are a couple of other addresses where it's super useful to just have some basic facts at your disposal. <laughs> but none of those things which should, according to modern wisdom, constitute my identity. I deny all of them for myself. Other people can do what they want. The reason I learned to deny all of those identities other than that, that I am consciousness operating in a human body is because I would have committed suicide by now otherwise. Because my material existence is fragile. The planet is fragile. Societies are fragile. Augustine or Augustine, depending on whether you're Catholic or Protestant, they pronounce it differently. Um, as, a, as a friend of mine put it, was writing when you know, the barbarians were at the gate of Rome and the plumbing had stopped working. Um, civilizations do end. What are we, we going to do then? What does anything matter? If, if civilization can end, is there any point to anything? And I'll tell you the conclusion that came to me. I did not come up with this, it came to me, which is a very different proposition. I don't think I am thought at by my alcoholism, by my ego, and by God. My only real agency is to pick which thoughts I'm going to listen to, which ideas I'm going to believe. A lot of my life, I'm certainly as a disagreeable teenager, I would say constantly, there is no point to my life. I have no purpose. Ironically, I was right because I wasn't living to any purpose. I'm not to be blamed for that, but it was simply the case. It wasn't because I was bad, it's because I hadn't yet learned how to find a purpose. But anyway, I was greatly offended at the idea that my life had no purpose. But the question is, where did that idea come from, that my life should have a purpose? It certainly doesn't come from society. Uh, you look at how many lives, people who die as children, what's the, what's the purpose there? It's, in the material, it's very difficult to, to see purpose. These millions of people living very difficult lives. Only a few people can succeed in the material sense. 
If you look at the natural world, I do, uh, the example a friend always gives is, is a beach where thousands of these turtles hatch from shells and only a handful make it to the sea. The rest are picked off by birds. Nature is immensely wasteful. Society is immensely wasteful of people. I didn't learn that I should have a purpose from the world. I think it's innate. Where did it come from? If not from here, where did it come from? Fairness, even more the case, is not taught by the natural world. It's certainly not taught by the world I see around me. Yet I'm offended when things aren't fair. Where did that come from? Because it doesn't come from here. And there are lots of other things which clearly, to me, don't come from here. God is not mocked. That sense that there is a purpose is real. Because it can't be eradicated by experience. One never quite gives up. Why? Because there is a reality to it. The light cannot be entirely extinguished. And the conclusion that I came to, or the idea that the conclusion that came to me was that my life has a purpose, but I won't necessarily see what it is. I don't know if anyone has read the Narnia books by C.S. Lewis. They're not yet conference approved. <laughs> literature. However, as the big book of aficionados will, will, will know, page 87 says there are many useful books and see where religious people are right. So you get to pick which religious people, if any, you, it isn't obligatory, nothing's obligatory. You get to pick. And in the last of the Narnia books, Narnia comes to an end with a great battle and the goodies lose and pass through to a higher realm. Um, I read a meditation book sometimes where it suggests uh, doing a daily inventory but also doing some spiritual reading and it says that in preparing for this exercise, we retreat from the shadow land. And what brings me peace, oddly, is the sense that the material world is the shadow land. There is something greater going on. And I'm nobody's fool. I don't think I've been tricked here because I'm like the little coffee machine that now runs far more effectively and far more efficiently and far more harmoniously in my material life, realizing that it is only a fragment of reality. Um, in the big book, which is where they put the instructions, I, I say that because I did not know that for many years in AA. Uh, uh, one of our speakers, who I think we're hearing on Sunday, was launched into sort of mission control of AA in her first meeting, I understand. Uh, I wasn't. I, I, I started right on the edges in some very strange corners of the realm. <laughs> and found myself uh, traveling for many years, trying to find where the core of it was and I found the core of it in the book which was given to me in my first meeting but no one told me what to do with it other than read it uh, but that doesn't have one's got to do what's in it again what Paul said um, you, you've got to take the action and one of the sections which I find immensely useful in the big book is where it talks about where it talks about self and where it talks specifically about the seven areas of self. 
And whenever I'm upset by anything, whenever I'm disturbed by something, page 66, I want things to have gone my way and they haven't. I've got to find out what my way is so I can let go of it. And that's what the rest of the steps do. So step two says God will wave the magic wand and perform wonders, but boy, have you got to, have you got to do some work. And the fact-finding and fact-facing expedition of step four, I think, has only one purpose. It's for me to recoil with horror at what I find and let go of it completely so that I run screaming into the arms of a higher power and say, what do you want me to do today? And my higher power says nothing grander than answer the phone when it rings. Fulfill your AA obligations dutifully and quietly and quickly. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Look after the home. Listen more than you speak. Very simple things. I'm not given anything grand to do. I do trust that in my fulfillment of those small tasks, I'm playing the only cards I'm being dealt. If I play them well, according to God, I'm fulfilling my purpose. I can't see what effect anything I do has in the world, either immediately, nearby, many years to come. I think of things that people said to me 30 years ago in AA meetings, which still rattle around my mind, that they might have forgotten them a moment later. Who knows what is significant? What is significant in the world is not necessarily what is significant in God's eyes. But back to the point. The point, I have to do some work in step four. And I had to look at uh, when I am my own higher power, what does my life look like? What is important to me? Because that is what needed to be set aside for this promise in step two to ultimately come true. I couldn't serve two masters. A friend of mine who's very religious says a, double man, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Emmett Fox talks about the same thing, about you get into a taxi at Penn Station and one minute you say Battery Park, the next minute you say Harlem, then you say the Lincoln Center, and the taxi driver is just going to go around in circles. You won't get anywhere. And that's where I was going wrong for many years in AA. I thought God was there to help me live my material life more successfully, when what I should have been doing was having one aim and one aim only, which is to do the next right thing, trusting that if it was revealed to me to be the the best option as to what God's will might be. If I did that, God would be pleased. And that is what mattered. And I had to look in the step four at the horror of what my values were. It says we can't fool ourselves about values. And I, I'll give you some little examples. Um, One of them is security. And for many years, uh, I worked immensely long hours thinking, if I have enough money in the bank, if I pay off my mortgage, uh, if I have enough of a security buffer, I will feel safe. And I never did feel safe. Whatever I got, I was now frightened of losing. And then inflation comes along. And then stock market crashes. And then your industry changes. And your job no longer exists in the same way. And it happens suddenly and no one saw it coming. Anything can happen in the material world. I, I talks in the 12 and 12 that there is no security in the world. It talks instead about durable satisfactions of doing a job well. That's what I have to push all my poker chips onto. That's the hand. 
There's a line from Into the Woods, which is a Sondheim musical, uh, which weaves together lots of different fairy tales. And one of them is Little Red Riding Hood. And she says this wonderful line, which borrowed its way into my mind maybe 25 years ago and has come back to me, and it's this. Do not put your faith in a cape and a hood. They will not protect you the way that they should. Little Red Riding Hood thinks she's going to be fine against the wolf with her little red cape. The immense efforts I made to establish a, a presence in the material world to have to own my own home are no more effective than Little Red Riding Hood and her little red cape. Because in the material world, the wolf is real. But it doesn't matter in the way that I thought it did. The same with all of the other all of the other areas. There's, there's too much to go into. Uh, but ambitions as well. That's the, that's the other one. Uh, I thought, if only I succeed, if only I achieve. I was something of a performing monkey when I was a child. My parents would wheel me out to do this and that when anyone came to visit. Put a little bow tie on a child. It'll be on heroin by the age of 18. Um, <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Um, uh, and I've got this line which, again, was borrowed its way into my mind and has come back recently from Marcus Aurelius. Where have they gone, the brilliant, the insightful ones, the proud, short-lived creatures, long dead, some of them not remembered at all? Some become legends, some lost even to legend. In his book, Meditations, I found immensely helpful to remind me again and again and again which horse not to back. And I'm going to finish on a, a story. There's an essay by C.S. Lewis um, where he talks about a character. I'm sorry if I wasn't intending to repeat myself after something I said the other night, but it's the story which is in my mind, so I'm going to do it. He talks about, C.S. Lewis talks about a character in uh, King Lear, who sees one of the other characters, old Gloucester, having his eyes gouged out unfairly, cruelly. Old Gloucester was um, a good man. And this character, first servant, that's all we know about him, has no name. How's that for anonymous? Not even a first name and an initial. First servant. He sees what must be done. He steps forward to, he points his blade into the chest of his master to avenge old Gloucester. Regan stabs him from behind. That's the end of him. He gets eight lines in the whole play. But that is his role. I don't get to decide that I should be important in the world. If I'm given a role to play, I play the role. That is it. But the reason it's not as grim as it might sound, I'm not the first servant. I'm a child of God, the actor playing that role, with whom God is well pleased if I play that role. So it's okay. Restoration to sanity with alcohol means restoration to a state when I can stay sober no matter what, provided I take other, certain other steps. Being restored to sanity in all other areas when I'm practicing step 12 is to move from a position, really all of my character defects are like miniature addictions. That the dynamics of them are the same, a persistent return to a destructive pattern. Anyone can make a mistake once. If it keeps happening, uh, there's a compulsion there. 
and I'm powerless, not guilty. Unfortunately, so is everyone else, which is why you have to let them off the hook. They're pa even them. You know the person. <laughs> powerless, not guilty. A persistent return to a destructive pattern. Insanity is what doesn't work. Sanity is what does work. So the restoration is from a system which fails catastrophically to a system which functions very well. And actually, the two last things I will finish with in the hour, don't worry. I used to get all wrapped up in my sponsee's business. And I don't anymore. <laughs> um, I do three things for my sponsees. Just three. And those three are I explain the program to them. I show them how to apply the program to specific situations, and I get to act as a course corrector if, as I do, I pay attention and I see someone veering off track, I'll give a little yank on the tether and say, oi, and point them back in the right direction. That is it. Uh, when I start a sponsorship relationship, I send them a list of things that I have to remind myself I'm not and I inform them that I'm not. And here is the list. I'm not an emergency service. I'm not a taxi. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a therapist. I'm not an analyst. I'm not a nutritionist. A friend. I'm not a friend. I'm not a housing service. I'm not an employment agency. I'm not a problem solver. I'm not a troubleshooter. An untangler of knots. A soothsayer. An oracle a judge, a moral arbiter, a citizen's advice bureau, a life coach, a bank, a search engine, a parent, or a power source. I, as a newcomer, wanted to be rescued by an authority figure who would fail, then I could blame them. If I play the opposite side of that game, I'm not doing them any favors. This might seem cold, but it is what works in my experience. There are lots of different people. People have other experiences. That's fine. But with me and the way I'm bent and broken and twisted, this is what really works. And people are forced from day one to start to depend on a higher power, not on me. I'm the dinner lady. I'm not the chef. And I'm certainly not the food. <laughs> With my best friend, uh, we'd relatively recently, or he chiefly, had got a new place to live uh, in the country somewhere. We're going to be retiring there, me and my other half and him. Um, and he died. Okay, we've got to deal with this. I turned this over to a higher power. And I can confidently say I feel his presence at all times. I'm not frightened of anything anymore. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.